Hello, welcome to the Praying Christian Women podcast. I am Alana here with Jamie back after a long summer break. So welcome back. It's so good to see you. Yeah, it's very fun. And I, you know, if you're watching YouTube, um, you know, it is what it is. I think <laughs> it's it's definitely a little in progress. It's an unpacked I am podcasting in, room. It is, but I'm, yeah, and it might feel, I think it's a little echoey still. We're going to work on some acoustics, but we're back and it's very cool and interesting and neat to be in a new office slash podcast studio that's not a closet, which, I mean, the closet yeah. was great for acoustics, I got to say. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But I have no, elbow I'm room. I know. <laughs> if I ever come down and visit, like we could both sit in the same room. <laughs> we could sit like, like, like we could Rocks make an actual other. studio. Uh, yeah. Like there's room. Like I'm, yeah. Yeah. Now I just need well, to get some house plants because I love, I love the look of your house plants and stuff. Well, so. welcome to your new home. I am, I am happy for you and glad you're settling in. Yeah. Oh, but, and it just also occurred to me, I used to try to have a house plant on the desk kind of in view, right. especially that prayer plant. But yeah. I always had to do this weird thing where I had to grab the plant, take yeah. it back to a place because there were no windows in the There's closet. no windows in your closet. <laughs> so I actually have windows in here so I can like have home, I can house- They can live there. House plants, I'm so excited. Aww. <laughs> well, let me know if you need me to try to mail you some cuttings or anything. Well, my cuttings, I my cuttings survived. They, Yay. I didn't know if they would, but they did survive and they're perking up now. Like I have them in the window, Good. in the kitchen and the cuttings that you gave me. Yeah. Those little, little plants actually probably are going to need to be repotted soon. So. Well, maybe it's because of you. I've been having a weird new recurring dream and it's that I'm either back at my parents' house, like as a young adult getting ready to move out, or I'm in college moving in or out of a dorm. And I'm trying to decide if I can pack my house plants into a suitcase. It so, might be. It might maybe be. that is from you and your move across the country. <laughs> well, it's funny because I, I mean, we went through a little bit of like, like they did take work to maneuver. And then when we were in the trailer and then we were in the mm -hmm. the temporary house and stuff. So it was kind of a, like a joke between my husband and me, like, just like, okay, we got to find a place for the plants, but I'm like, for the it plants, was totally yeah. worth it because they're special, but... you know, just to have like, yeah. I could have replaced them, but they're, they're special plants. So I'm excited is. to give yeah. progress on, on how they do the little I'm excited plant, too. like kind of died back a little, but uh -huh. it's coming back. And so it's not flourishing yet, uh, but it's ready. It's going to flourish. Good. So I'm excited. And to also add to my repertoire. Yeah. No, maybe I think that probably does make a lot of sense why I'm having that recurring dream because it's, it it's always that same feeling. It's like, well, I could get new plants when I get there, but these are the ones like these are mine, you know, I, or, or sometimes the dream is I'm at the airport and I realize I've left all the plants behind and, you know, like who's going to take care of that? Oh, well, it, that's no. like the dreams, like the newborn baby dreams that I used to have when we had little kids mm. was leaving them somewhere and driving off wow. and yeah when, there is a, when you come to visit i'm going to make it a win when you come to visit we will um there's a very cool little plant shop but it's almost mm. like a speakeasy it's not always Fine. open i've never been oh, in, weird and it's usually <laughs> not open but it has need a password to get inside in? and it's near the ups Fine. store where we have our personal mailbox so every uh -huh. time i go there i'm like okay, what are the hours? And I keep forgetting the hours that it's open, but it's usually not when I'm around. <laughs> uh -huh, so uh -huh. We're going to make a point if I that don't will go be there before. Fine. Yeah, I'm sure it's a very top secret, very awesome, special <laughs> plant, well, plant shop. I hope it's a like good plant shop and not a bad yeah, right? plant shop. <laughs> <laughs> I went to a writer's retreat in Omaha and at for the last day, we all went to a plant store and we all bought like little two inch jade plants. Oh. And the idea was going to be like, we'll all post updates of our pictures of how our jades are doing. The dog ate mine. So. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. She's a, she can be a little naughty sometimes. But anyway. So this is coffees, the plant eater. This is Buttercup, the puppy, Buttercup. the golden doodle. Oh, She's, anything yeah. with, yeah, anything with golden or yeah, lab I know. are gonna, yeah, they're gonna just eat whatever. 
Um, they're going to do some naughty stuff. Did I tell you I was in the pet ER with Archie? Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Because from, of grapes. Was it grapes? Yep. Yeah. It turns out that he was fine and that he's probably not either not one of the dogs that has issues with it or just right. whatever, but his, yeah, yeah, he, he looked like, I, th I thought he was getting really sick, but yeah, he'll yeah. eat just about anything. So got to keep an eye on him. <laughs> we need to be <sighs> sponsored by some kind of like pet health insurance company or something. I'm telling you, anytime I see, anytime I'm looking out for sponsorships, I'm like, you know, we, we yes. definitely are pet people we need to we, we talk need to about the pet. dogs so if you're out there and you want to sponsor a <laughs> right. growing flourishing podcast that loves pets, we're your girls yep. absolutely well welcome back to the podcast for people who have been regular listeners uh you probably already are aware took the summer off while jamie and her family were moving and we are back and now we're still rolling out some interviews from last spring so in your podcast feed, you will be seeing some new episodes with interviews that are a couple months old. But as of right now, uh, Jamie and I are caught up on our episodes and we're just going to jump back into our Proverbs 31 series with the question of how does a Proverbs 31 woman pray? Yeah, and I, you know, it it was really fun re-listening to the first couple of episodes that we had done just to kind of get get me up to speed for this mm -hmm. one um just because i felt like there is there's so much in the text but there's just there are so many implications outside of the text with this whole passage mm -hmm. so i i'm excited i love this um i love this passage of scripture and i've been loving it even more since we've gotten to kind of pick it apart so yeah. Yeah. It's one of those where it's almost like the Beatitudes. Sometimes you just read it, you know it, you're like, okay, been there, done that. Um, and this is really giving us a reason to just kind of slow down and ask ourselves different questions. Because most people read Proverbs 31 as a prescription. How can I be a good wife? How can I be a good mom? How can I be a godly woman? And so looking at it through the lens of prayer adds a layer that I've never explored before as well. Yeah. And, you know, I mentioned on our previous episodes um, that there was a, an episode way back on Proverbs 31, and you can check that out. You'll see it. Um, I guess if you listen to week one, I think it was, yeah, part one, I talk about it, but, um, and I don't, I don't have it handy. So maybe I'll mention it later, um, the actual episode, but it was an incredible um it was just an incredible deep dive into kind of the biblical background of Proverbs 31. And one of the cool things that we found out in that episode and just through talking um, was that Proverbs 31 is actually an acrostic. It's an acrostic mm, poem. Mm -hmm. And there is not only, if you, if you listen to that episode, it goes into, there's not only just like verbal, um, like, teaching or the, the words aren't just put together in literature, but they're actually symbolic and the actual symbols, much like Chinese characters, like, um, or uh, hiragana in Japanese, they're, um, they actually are word pictures. So not only, mm -hmm. so when mm -hmm. the person was reading this and really any of the, the Hebrew writing, um, but when the person would be reading this, they would be actually not only reading the text, but they would have another layer of word pictures that they would see that represented other things. So it's it's just an it's it's really neat to look at it in all the dimensions. Um, yeah. But yeah, obviously we are looking at the translated version at this point, and really the questions we're asking are. What does this really say? How have we gotten it wrong? And how can we get it right and apply it today? That's kind of how we're mm. looking at this today. Yeah, yeah. So I'll start, uh, we'll just read a couple of verses and see how far we get. So we're starting at Proverbs 31, verse 13. Mm -hmm. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. 
arms are strong for her tasks. I think we'll stop there because I'm going to guess we're not going to get, <laughs> we might not get through all that. And we're definitely not going to get farther. <laughs> so where do you want to start with that, that section and what jumps out to you? Um, so when we talked a couple of weeks ago or the last two weeks, I guess, about, um, about how we get it wrong sometimes with Proverbs 31, mm -hmm. this part is one of the most challenging for me because it talks about selecting wool and flax, working with eager hands, um, getting up while it's still night. So I'm going to be honest when it comes to my prayer life, when it comes to anything, I am not a morning person and I get up very early when I need to. And I love the idea of being up early, but it is hard for me to be super productive, super early in the morning before I'm fully woken up. Mm -hmm. And I'm most productive mid morning or even late at night. I'm more of a night owl when it comes to getting stuff mm -hmm. done. So when I looked at that, I used to kind of shy away from some of this. I, I, have you noticed that uh -huh. like with certain scriptures, you're just like, mm, I, I'm going to move past that for now because I just don't think that I'm going to be able to do it that well or do that particular mm -hmm. thing. Um, but when I, when I read this kind of without the guilt, um, I don't know. It just, I love, I love the idea that, that you can read this as how does this apply to me? And it's like, we talk about a lot of times, don't pray like somebody else. If someone mm -hmm. else says that you have to get up at 4 AM to be an effective prayer, that's not necessarily accurate. So reading this, I feel freedom at this point in my life to read it more as, okay, she gets up while it is still night. She provides food and portions for her female servants. Maybe I'm not going to be as productive at that time of day, but, mm. but one of the things that I can get from this is that I am, you know, that, that eagerly working with eager hands, where, where are the areas in my life um, that I feel called to work, whether it's for my family, mm -hmm. for God, identify those things. What is my most productive time to do those things? And when are those times, um, when are those things going to meet up? And then, and then right. I can kind of move forward in that area rather feeling, mm -hmm. rather than feeling guilty that this person in scripture gets up while it's still dark. Right. Yeah. And it's not saying that to be a godly woman, you must get up while it is still dark, right? Like so many of us have only looked at this passage as like, a prescription and a command and really just a description and it's a poetic description, right? So it's almost as if, you know, that poem, like she walks in beauty, it, it would almost be as if like we took that poem that is describing one poet's ideal of a beautiful woman. And it is telling us what we must do and be and look like, right? Whereas it's different for all of us. And so I think, yeah, if people come into this passage with feelings of guilt, just always remind yourself, this is a description of one man's ideal wife. And this is not God pounding us on the head saying to be a godly woman, you must do every single thing that this woman does in exactly the same way that she does it. Because I know for me, if I were to get up while it's still night to, and, and she's not getting up while it's night to, to uh, pray. She's getting up to, to work, right. To provide food for her family. If, if I did that, I would be a workaholic. And so I know I need to, <laughs> to not do that. And so I think that, yeah, we can look at this through the lens of this is a poetic description. Um, this is not a 10 commandments to women to be exactly like this person. But I love what you said, the, information we can glean from it can apply to all of us. So she gets up while it's still night to do this stuff. Um, what does that mean for you? When are you most productive? I think that is an excellent question for all of us to know about ourselves. What's your kind of chronotype, right? When are you going to be best at doing this type of activity? When are you going to be best at doing that type of activity? And try in as much as you can to fit your prayer times into the times that make the most sense, both with what you have practically and logistically on your plate, and also with the rhythms and the biorhythms of the chronotype that God has designed you with. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, the the interview that I mentioned before, it's, it's episode 115 with Lauren Cruz. 
um, and her book is Strength of a Woman, Why You Are, Proverbs 31. And she brings up the idea or the fact really that this was sung over women. Like this was not um, mm -hmm. instructions like do this, do this, do this. This was a celebration of womanhood. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't yeah. intended to be a caricature of a woman. Mm -hmm. It was intended to say, these are the things that our women collect in the collective do. Yes, I and, love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was like, let's elevate them and celebrate them. And so another way that you can pray through this, I mean, I think there are two ways as we pray through scripture. It's for me, it's like, okay, how can I be more like scripture, but also how do I see, call stuff out in yourself um, yeah. in creative ways. So she selects wool and flax and works with e eager hands. Thank you, God, for the ministries that you've given me, my family, um, my the, the podcast, the writing, um, friendships, church, whatever the things are, and call those out and celebrate the the things that God has given you. And what are the ways that God has equipped you? What are the ways he's given you energy? Think back to times mm -hmm. when, um, when, when you've done something difficult and God has sustained you, like they're just all different mm -hmm. ways. But when we look at this whole passage as celebrating womanhood and celebrating who we are and, and the ways that God has uniquely manifested some of these things in our own lives, without having to feel like you have to stick to the letter of each one of these things that is really freeing i i've never heard it mentioned that we can look at this kind of as a collective celebration of all women of women you know, yeah i've i've heard of it as a this is a celebration of what one woman does over a lifetime and that frees us from having to be like oh no i need to do these things every day but then if you add on to that this is a collection of what women have done throughout history <laughs> That's pretty amazing. You know, we all come from mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers and all the way back who have done all of these things, right? And that doesn't mean that one individual did all of these in a 24 hour period or that we are expected to do the same. But the fact that you exist and are listening to this podcast today means that you have, um, I think it's dozens, I don't know if I'm getting the math right, but dozens of of women who are your direct um, predecessors who have worked hard to feed their families and protect their families and provide for their families. And they have worked through famine and survived and they have lost infants and carried on and they have um, survived terrible marriages and still found ways to protect their children. Like that is an amazing celebration so let's go back um who who are some of the women in your um ancestry that you really just admire for some of the things that they did or overcame on i guess on both sides of you know my my parents on both sides neither like both both sides both of my parents grew up with not a ton of money i mean it was like hmm. they they on my dad's side, there were a lot of kids and just, you know, not a lot of money to, mm -hmm. to go around at the time. I mean, and same on my mom's side, um, you know, they just they kind of made do with what they had. But I remember specifically, so I would say on my my dad's side, my grandmother was incredibly prayerful. Like from mm -hmm. the time I can remember, she would do prayer walks before I knew prayer walking was a thing. She would actually like speed walk around our house when they came to visit and, yeah. and, and she would just come like, and we would kind of laugh, but she'd come like briskly prayer, like walking through around our, and our uh, house wasn't that big, but there was like this yeah. circuit that she would walk and, <laughs> and I'd be like, grandma, what are you doing? She's like, I'm praying. I'm prayer walking or sometimes she would leave the table and just at dinner time randomly leave mm. the table and 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 go she'd just say sorry I have to she sometimes wouldn't even say what she was doing and yeah. uh -huh. it was that she felt a prayer burden and had to pray at that exact moment um so like there was definitely a prayer legacy there um yeah on her side I definitely feel that she 
Um, I know there was a time when she went back to work and my dad talks about how she did go back to work after the kids were a little bit older and, um, and just hearing about um, how that uh, fulfilled her. She really loved working mm, outside What the did home. she do? I believe she worked at either a psychiatrist's office or a hospital. Um, mm -hmm. And she wasn't a nurse. She wasn't trained. Mm -hmm. I think it was like an assistant or clerical type mm -hmm. thing. But mm -hmm. she would talk about like she he said she they would sit down and she would just light up like talking about Aww. the things that she would experience there. Um, and then just the ways that she nurtured her her family and and kind of yeah. was an example to me. And then on my mom's side, um, I feel like that that grandma, she persevered through a lot of um, loss throughout her mm -hmm. life and lost a lost a child um my uncle when he was in his early 40s and um my you know my, my grandfather had dementia and she persevered through that but mm -hmm. she was for her like i see her as just being kind of a pillar of unmoving strength even though i know it wrecked her in many ways mm -hmm. but she just kept plugging along and like being kind of the anchor for our family yeah. and things like that um but both of both grandmothers just looking back i could see they um they did they worked eagerly with their hands they were always busy mm -hmm. they were always doing something making something for us in the kitchen mm -hmm. so yeah all of those things how about you yeah well i i love the thought of your prayer warrior your grandma and my prayer warrior grandma like being up in heaven praying for alana and jamie i, I yes. think that would be just amazing it <laughs> absolutely just... would be <laughs> It I don't know be. if that's how it works, but I love that thought. Um, yeah, I've talked about my grandma on my mom's side quite a bit and what a prayer warrior she was. Mm. Um, and yeah, same. She came from a hard background, both as a kid and then as an adult. She grew up in China. Her parents were missionaries there. They survived um, all, all the pre, if I remember, I think it was pre-World War II bombings in Shanghai. Um, and like my grandma took a boat from China to the States when she was like 15 or 16 all by herself. Like she, <laughs> it was pretty impressive, um, all the stuff that she did. And, and similar to your experience, like had a very turbulent and not safe marriage, um, lost two of her daughters as young adults. So yeah, endured so much. And I never met her mom the one who was a missionary in China, but same kind of thing. You know, if you're a missionary on foreign soil in a war-torn nation trying to protect your children, you know, you can only imagine what what you're you're going through. And then on the other side of the family, my great-grandparents, so both my great-grandmas on my dad's side came from, do I have, I forget how many great-grandmas I have on my, yeah, two great-grandmas on my dad's side. <laughs> They both were born in Japan and um, immigrated to the U.S. in the early 1900s. And that in itself is, you know, a lot to go through. And then they had children, started families in America, got sent to internment camps during World War II. So, again, just endured a lot. Um, and you do what you do to keep your family together, you know. And I think that is something absolutely to celebrate you go through stressful times, you lose babies, you, you have a rocky marriage, you have health issues, you go through natural disasters or wars or famines, and still you persevere. Like, I love, and I know a lot of women um, have not made peace with this aspect of their bodies. I love that my body gains weight when I get stressed. <laughs> And because it reminds me that I was designed by God to survive famine so that I could take care of my family. Like that's a pretty impressive feat <laughs> that my body can do that, you know? And, and so I'll look at the scale and be like, yep, that was my seven COVID pounds. Yep. That was my three empty nesting, you know, and I, I could just kind of track it. You know how some people track their kids growth on the wall. Oh, oh, I track, you check it on the scale. I check my weight game. Be like, yep, I hit this one in 2020 because we were going through this. And I hit this in, you know, 2024 when we went through that. And 
And I celebrate that God designed us. Like when I was studying um, the really devastating North Korea famine in the um, 1990s, and this is where the book Flower Swallow um, kind of was set. Um, the the famine was so bad that the first people to die, which is not surprising, it's the elderly first, and then it's the very young, mm -hmm. and then it's the older children, right? So like first it's the the really old and the really young, like the babies and toddlers. Then it turns into like the preschool and elementary age kids. The next subset to die is actually the healthy young men because they have no fat. <laughs> Wow. And the ones who like make it the longest, they're the the middle aged mamas and the grandmas and and the ones that God designs to be the last line of making sure humanity survives in a devastating natural disaster like that, you know. Um, okay, so, so you need yeah. you need to add we need to add a chapter to our book because when we're <laughs> celebrating womanhood i know you know in our book we're talking prayer wise but i think such a like a foundation of embracing our womanhood is mm -hmm. realizing that being real skinny is not healthy and right. it's okay to i love i've never heard anyone ever say what you just said about, mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, I love my stretch marks because it means I was able to carry mm -hmm. this child. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. looking at the scale in times of stress and not cursing it and being like, thank you, God, or winter, you know, yeah. I find that winter yes. is a time. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to Alaska, you know, we immediately yeah. put on a few pounds because we moved there yeah. in the spring and your body knows what it's meant you, to God. do. Thank you, God, for that. And I, yes. I've never heard anyone say that. So I know that's not a overtly spiritual thing but our bodies uh -huh. and our and our spirits are all interconnected and when you're at war yeah. with your body and then yes. your prayer life suffers everything suffers so mm -hmm. that needs mm -hmm. to be a chapter well um i love that and this is my um this is my announcement to you i <laughs> i invited an interviewer onto the podcast that i haven't told you about yet jamie so Yay! oh i'm excited my, my strengths coach becca um, she and I were chatting I in a coaching session and we got onto the topic of menopause and Becca's about five years older than I am. Um, and the stuff she mentioned, similar to what you said, like, I have never heard a woman talk about menopause in this way. And it is so helpful. So at some point it might be before, it might be after, um, it'll probably be after this episode releases. So that is coming up. So <laughs> this is, this is my, um, let me get my you a list teaser. of my questions. Like, I know, she, right? I, yeah, I'm, I'm right, in, right, right on the verge right now. So this is my teaser to the audience. And this is also my way to let Jamie know since I never mentioned, oh, by the way, we're going to have a guest on the show. <laughs> oh, I'm super excited. Yeah, I love talking about perimenopause and menopause selfishly. <laughs> <laughs> getting right? all the information I can get. I'm, tell me more. Tell me right more. There. Tell me everything. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Love it. But I love that we can look at all of this as a celebration of womanhood and a celebration of what our, our ancestors, our direct ancestors, as well as our just kind of collective womanhood in general what we endured, you know, yeah. like you think about how popular, like how many readers love the frontier kind of historical fiction um, to, to the point where sometimes I think it, it might be dangerously over glamorized. And that's just my personal opinion, but you got to look at those prairie women with awe and respect because their lives were impossibly hard yeah. and they did endure, you know? So I love looking at Proverbs 31, like this, this adds like, and not even an entire new chapter, like an entire new encyclopedia of how we can be looking at this section as a celebration of womanhood. And I think we talked about it before. Have you kept up with any of the science studies about genetic memory and specifically trauma being passed down? No, but I have heard um, there... There's a book that I have been meaning to listen to or read and uh, that, that deals with that, but mm -hmm. I have just heard multiple people in recent years talk about that idea that you, 
yeah, that, that we used to think mm-hmm. that you're just born with a clean slate yes. of DNA, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that there are mutations that can be passed down. And I love that we, cause we've kind of touched on it as spiritual, um, not spiritual baggage. What do you call it? What, what did we? Generational sin generational is the one that sin, I've heard of, but it's not even necessarily sin. But it's not you know? sin, but generational baggage that yes. you can kind of start Inherit. to. Inherit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, some people think of that in a spiritual sense. Other people think of it at, in a metaphysical, like past life kind of sense, mm-hmm. which obviously we would reject. But right. when you, but you can't dispute the science of it and it makes so much sense and it's biblical. The Bible talks about some of these, yes. some of these effects that are far reaching, not just uh, yes. to us, but yeah. So what were you going to say about that? Have you, so, been yeah, like when you we have any were, recommendations for, well, years? I was thinking like when we were growing up in science class and doing like Mendel squares and all of that, it very much was like um, the acquisition of inherited blah 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 like that's bunk you know like if you're if your mom was good at baking that doesn't mean you're going to be good at baking right (laughs) nature versus nurture it's all genetic yeah Yeah. and and now they really are showing no it's it's a lot more than it's it's more complicated which it's supposed to be like we're not supposed to be able to boil down humanity into what's like a g t and c in our dna Um, but the study that really, um, always stuck with me, they took these mice and they gave them a specific smell and then an unsettling, um, like electric shock. And so the mice obviously learned to be afraid of that smell. Then they bred the mice and I believe it was like the third generation of mice were still scared of that smell. Um, or at the very least the second generation, they were so scared of the smell, even though they had never experienced the unsettling association. And um, there were other studies about, um, you know, if specifically your mom or your grandma, if they went through trauma, that there's going to be health um, health consequences to you, even if it didn't happen while your mom was pregnant with you, right? And and so, yeah, there, there is a sense of, collectively what we have gone through. I think about that a lot with my um, my grandma being a young girl and my great grandparents being young adults during the Japanese American internment. They learned that you had to passively accept really bad things and make the best of it. And I love and admire and respect the attitude they had about it. But I also recognize that to an extreme, that's going to be what makes me not speak out when I'm supposed to speak out about stuff. Um, It's there in my culture, it's there in my upbringing, and I believe it's somehow there in my DNA and in my constitutional makeup. And so I think it can be really interesting um, if you want to look at it, not through kind of the genetic side, but through the generational side of things, the spiritual generational side, what were some of the, the fears or the traumas that the, the, the women in your lineage went through and how might that impact you today? And we can pray to break some of those generational curses, right? That's, that's Mm -hmm. probably the word that we were looking for generational curses, right? Um, Right. So maybe in my case, let's hypothetically say I've got a daughter who is being bullied and refuses to stand up for herself because she's too scared. And I can recognize going back to at least my great grandparents. And again, I am not saying that they should have done anything different than they did. Right. Um, and I admire the um, the respectful stoicism at which they accepted <laughs> the atrocities that were thrust upon them. Um, however, I don't want my daughter, my hypothetical daughter, to just accept being bullied now because she doesn't realize she has a voice. So I can pray not only for her confidence, but I can almost go back in that lineage and pray against um yeah, that generational curse, for lack of a better word, just for that aspect of our nature and our personalities and our culture and our subculture and our upbringing that makes the women in my family so scared to speak up about stuff. Right. And um, if you recognize 
where it comes from. I think it can also tell you a lot about yourself. Like I was, it probably was only in the last 10 years or so that I even made that connection between my, um, between the internment camps and where I'm at today, right? Like not wanting to, to speak up for myself. And once you recognize it, um, it, it is, it helps you know how to pray. And it also gives you compassion for yourself because you're not like, Alana, why are you so like stupid and afraid to say something? It's like, no, I get in your ancestors past was the fear that if you did spoke up, you might even lose your life for it. Right. And therefore it makes sense that you're scared of this. Now let's learn a new way, you know? So it's kind of, it's being more gentle with yourself too, if you know where some of that comes from. It really is. And when you look at it from a scientific perspective, it makes perfect sense why God would design us that way to be able to pass those mm -hmm. things on. Otherwise, right. how would, uh, I mean, you just think of, of migration, you think of yes. aversion to, you know, mm -hmm. why, why does the sight or smell of something mm -hmm. dead Right. Revile us. Even if we've never seen anything dead before or smelled yes. it, that smell yeah. and that sight, it produces a visceral reaction. How did that yes. happen? Well, it's, yeah. it's a way it of protecting us. us. And mm -hmm. you know, just all of those different things like, um, that is that, yeah, it's very fascinating. And it's one of those things that's like, it's just one, one more, um, piece of evidence that just kind of reminds us that about about the holistic nature of body, mind and spirit, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. we call spirit might have elements of science to them, not that there isn't a part of us that lives eternally after our flesh goes away. But mm -hmm. I think some of the things that we attribute to emotion, I should say emotion, not spirit, but to emotion okay. or um, mental things like a lot mm -hmm. of the, a lot of those things are directly like mental is physical because yeah. of brain chemistry mm -hmm. and because of whatever yeah. and genetics. I don't know. I, it's just very interesting, but I bringing it back to Proverbs 31. Yes. I think that's a very, um, I think it would actually be a whole other separate valuable meditation using Proverbs 31 to do some research. If you don't know about your ancestors or mm -hmm. even your immediate like i'm just thinking i there's so much i don't know about my maternal and paternal grandparents i yeah. probably should talk to my dad and my aunt to get a little more information about them and mm -hmm. appreciate them more you know i i think yeah. it's um but yeah just to be able to to appreciate some of those things about the ones that have gone before us yeah well and i even think about my kids like my youngest son is floored sometimes when he hears something that in my opinion is like super basic knowledge about me. It's like, oh, you've got a brother. I mean, that's a little extreme because he's met, <laughs> he's met his right. uncle, but it's yeah. like, um, yeah, I went to college for biology, you know? And he's right. like, oh, you studied biology. I'm like, I thought this was common knowledge, but it's not like, right. They don't, don't know, know what, a lot about yeah, us. I didn't know what my mom majored in in college. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I know what my dad did because it was related to his job, or at least I can guess and probably be right. But, you yeah. know, so there's even lots of things, you know, just about, um, you know, from parent to child that yeah. you don't think to ask because as the parent, you either assume your kid knows, or it's just not important. Like, you know, None of my kids know who my freshman year roommate was in college because it's never come up, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it is a really interesting thing. And, and I just want to say a word to people who maybe you don't have a relationship with your biological family. So maybe you don't know these things. Um, and it can feel like part of you is missing, right? It mm -hmm. could be like, well, I don't, like I knew a woman, um, friend of mine right after Scott and I got married and she'd been adopted and she didn't even know what race she was. And it really bothered her to not have a picture of kind of this, you know, cause so much of, of our personality is based on the traits that we acquired from our parents and the genetics we acquired from them. And so if you're a woman who is in a situation like that, like maybe you um, you never knew your birth parents or maybe your relationship with them is so uh, uh, broken that you you couldn't go and ask them these kinds of questions, um, you can still use this. And, and this is where our beautiful gift of imagination can come in. 
And I think we need to be careful that we don't take it as gospel truth. But I think another beautiful prayer exercise can be, God, show me some of the women in my past and just give me a picture of who they were, of what they came from, um, of what they would have wanted someone to pray for them. And maybe God will show you something through that. And again, I, I think we need to be a little careful because some people like what you were talking about in the secular world, some people will go so far as to like, you know, maybe you're doing that prayer and you see a woman in a field uh, picking cotton. And so in your mind, you're like, oh, in a past life, I, I was a cotton picker. Well, no, that maybe, <laughs> maybe it's some type of genetic memory, which I think does exist, but we don't know all the ins and outs of it yet. Um, and certainly isn't antithetical to anything biblical. Or maybe it's just your imagination, right? Maybe you never actually had a cotton picker in your lineage, but God still has a message for you in that, in that kind of picture, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to do it for myself. Be like, I think the first thing that I go back to is I never met my, um, grandma Becky's parents, but I picture them like in Shanghai and bombs are falling and they've got a young family and it must've been terrifying, you know? And of course I know how it ends. I know they all make it out. So I don't ever think about how scary and traumatizing that must've been, but then I can ask myself, okay, well, how, how might that be impacting me today? And I would have to kind of think through it. The, the immediate answer doesn't show up in my head. And then, so maybe I go through that. And let's say, hypothetically, I realize, oh, uh, they went through this really traumatic time. Maybe that's why as a young adult, I was always drawn toward like volatile men, which which isn't in my past history, but, you know, as a hypothetical example. Right. Um, and maybe I learned to pray something about that. And maybe I even decide to prayerfully break any generational curse so that the rest of my lineage doesn't follow that pattern. And then let's say hypothetically, I discover that, oh, you know what, during the bombings of Shanghai, they were all evacuated and living on a resort in Florida. To me, that doesn't negate the fact that God taught me something through what I imagined, right? Right. So when we're using our imagination, I think we need to know its limitations and to not say like, yes, God showed me a picture of my great grandma and, you know, and the room was this color and the walls were this color. You know, I, he could do that, but I don't see why he would choose to in, in the majority of cases. And even if we get it wrong, the details wrong, there's still something useful, right? So even if I got the details wrong in my hypothetical example, and they weren't in Shanghai, during the bombing, um, that still led me to pray to break these generational curses. And it still taught me something about myself. So it was still uh, a spirit led prayer, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's very similar to, along the lines of using fiction as a springboard for prayer. Yeah, it's very, exactly. you know, and only it's a little bit more personalized. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Another thing that um, that this brings up, just kind of this this whole passage about working with eager hands, um, and you know she considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Like, I think that this part of the passage is for well, is for everyone, obviously. But I think it gives permission. We've talked before about one of the things that Christian culture gets wrong sometimes about this, mm -hmm. which is caricaturizing the ideal Christian mm -hmm. woman as mm -hmm. Donna Reed. And, you know, just basically- I don't know who that is. Oh, you don't? See, we are, I was gonna, what year were you born? Cause we do 83. have- 83. I'm so millennial, I'm you're 76. definitely X. I mean, I'm yeah, X, so yeah. there is a difference. Yeah, and so um, Donna Reed was, uh, I didn't know her from, she, she was um, the Donna Reed show. Nick at Night okay. used to play, Nickelodeon did Nick at Night, and they played like some uh, of the old time, like Donna right. Reed. The black and, and white, yeah. Her and the black and So Donna Reed was one of those. And right. she was, you know, always wearing an apron. She would have been the one that would have been like, you know, going upstairs to get her best dress on before her husband got, got home. it. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. kids come home and she's got freshly baked cookies, Jimmy, yeah. you know, and stuff like Mrs. that. Mrs. Cleaver. <laughs> okay, that would be, yes, definitely a recognizable one. Um, okay. So I think a lot of times, I, I don't know that it's done so much anymore, but for a while, I think the Christian woman who was working either in the home or outside of the home mm -hmm. 
may have felt less than when she thought of the caricaturized Proverbs 31 woman. Um, and I just believe looking at this, it's very apparent that this, um, this celebrates women, whether they are, you know, hauling water for their family and mm -hmm. cooking in the house or whether they are making money somehow, buying and yeah. you know, wheeling and dealing with fields and yeah. earnings, planting a vineyard and setting about her work vigorously. Mm -hmm. Her arms are strong for her tasks. And that means whether it's carrying babies or, yes. or doing, you know, Chopping business, wood, business transactions, or chopping yeah. wood, or whatever needs to or be, or bagging like, groceries, yeah. or performing heart surgery. I love that. Yeah. So I um, think it's a celebration of wherever you are. Don't let anyone make you feel less than for pursuing mm -hmm. the calling that God has placed on your life. And I yeah. think we can do two things with that. We can examine, like you know, what what are my strengths? What are my tasks and my callings? And let's mm -hmm. celebrate that. Thank you, God. Where you know, um, thank you, God, for giving me the opportunities and the drive and the education or whatever it is to do these things in or out of the home. Um, and at the same time, we can do a flip and challenge ourselves with it and say, "Am I balanced? Where do I need to find more balance? Where do I need mm. to? Um, where are my blocks? This is where I struggle sometimes with." having an either or mindset, where do I feel limited to do all of the things that God is calling me to do? Because I feel like if I do this, then I'm giving up that, or if I do that, then I'm giving up this and not doing that well, whether it's working outside mm -hmm. the home and caring for a family or whether it's right. um, going to school and going to work full time or whatever the things are, just praying that God would mm -hmm. give you wisdom to do an audit of all of the things that you're called to and maybe a embrace the things that he's calling you to even if you don't feel like you have time or resources to do them because he's called you to them and he'll equip you or b weed out things and um thin the the things that mm -hmm. aren't callings from god and maybe put those aside and and so that you can have more room in your life to either thrive with the things he's called you to do or pick mm -hmm. up other things that he's calling you to that you don't have room for yet because you're holding on to self-imposed responsibilities yeah yeah i like that um i like the reminder to always look at the things that you feel like you should be doing and really ask yourself where is that coming from? Is that coming from God and the Holy Spirit and the Bible? Or is this coming from my own self-doubts or from my church family or from societal expectations? Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that women who are crushing it in the business world do feel very, um, in, in a lot of Christian churches, feel very out of place. And, and I love that Proverbs 31 celebrates these kind of women. And I love the reminder that we can look at this collectively. That doesn't mean that if you want to be Mrs. Cleaver or, or who was the one that you said? Donna Reed. Donna Reed. Um, maybe God's calling you to exactly that, but that doesn't mean that he is calling your sister and your aunt and your daughter to that, right? There are so many different ways that we can, that biblical womanhood can be expressed. And I think this passage really encourages us and reminds us to celebrate every single one of them. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> my dog's whining. I think oh, she's, I think I she's ready her. to wrap it up. That's so. so funny. She, and it's like, she can tell in your voice or she maybe can. she, maybe she has a con. I always thought dogs didn't have a concept of time, but it has been about an hour. Oh, they, yeah, no, they, I, our dog knows when it's dinner time. So I, there's, there's some kind of concept of time there. <laughs> Archie believes he's gotten to the point where he actually thinks he, like every time I leave and come back, he's, he goes to his bowl. Like, where's my yeah. food? Uh -huh. so I don't think we, he has a concept of time. I think coffee is extraordinary she's a little bit smarter than average <laughs> um, which has its pitfalls yes so but one thing I do uh if I come home in the evening I make sure that I don't feed the dogs right away because I don't like they're already crazy enough when people come come home and I don't want that to be coupled with the craziness of expecting dinner right away that's so. smart see you're yeah. smarter than the average dog owner 
I know. I well, smart, I thought you were going to say smarter than the average dog, which I would have agreed smarter to. than the average bear, right? Isn't that Yogi Bear's <laughs> mantra? Yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. I'm so glad we got to um, jump back in, and we are so glad to be back uh, a little more live in your podcast feed, at least in the same season now that uh, you're hearing us and we record. And I am really excited to continue on this discussion about Proverbs 31. Yeah, me too. Do we want to close in a prayer with Proverbs 31? Sure. You want to close this in prayer? That sounds perfect. Yeah, let me do that. I'm going to do that with my video. All right, Lord, we just thank you so much for um, Proverbs 31. Thank you for what it shows us about womanhood. Thank you for... The fact that we can use it as a tool to springboard prayer off of and and we just uh we just pray god for the qualities that you desire to be amplified in us to be amplified i just pray now god that you would bring to mind what are the tasks that you're calling us to what are the things that we see reflected in these passages in ourselves that we can celebrate and, and just help us to shed any expectations that are imposed on us by other people or our self-criticism or even the enemy's lies and just help us to see clearly who it is that you've created us to be, what season we're in and what you're calling us to in this season and, and maybe what you're calling us away from in this season and just let it be free from any influences of society or culture or pressure from anyone or anything outside of of you and your perfect will for us god we celebrate women today we celebrate the women that came before us and the women will the women that will come after us and we just pray god in jesus name that you will be at work in us and through us and, and just to be able to glorify you in everything that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.